has been part of the human peacekeeping force, receives accolades from, from the manner in which it has conducted itself, fair, just, proper, compared to others who use the stupid things in Cyprus and things like that. For example, the representative of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, for example, was caught in 1979 are using vehicles of the UN peacekeeping force to steal antiquities and sell them abroad. And Kurt Waldheim, the former Secretary General, friend of this, an Austrian himself, friend of the Austrian gentleman who was stealing the goodies, saves him from going to jail, things like that. But the Austrian, I mean, the, the Australian contingent it has been marked by fairness, and so you should be very proud of that. The other uh, issue that at least connects me to Liberty Victoria and uh, to the issue of human rights that preoccupies you as well is the fact that in Cyprus, leaving aside the issue of the invasion, the continued occupation, and so forth, there are major issues of human rights that have affected the Cyprus problem from day one. And I'll simply list them if you want to talk about these things, we will talk about them later. But you have things like ethnic cleansing, you have the rights of refugees in the displaced, you have rape and inhuman treatment, property confiscation, missing persons, uh, foreign settlers who are not economic refugees or political refugees, you have the destruction of the cultural heritage. So these are the kinds of issues that you can find in discussing Cyprus and the, site, the current dimensions of the Cyprus problem. So therefore, uh, the, even though my approach tonight is going to discuss more or less the evolution of the Republic of Cyprus over a 50-year period, because the 50th anniversary was very recent, so the Cyprus issue is directly related to issues of human rights and uh, actually one of my books was written exactly on the very topic. Uh, I hope, you know, some of you may have read it. Anyway, uh, the, 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 let me close with one comment, negative for Australia. You have uh, Alexander Downer, of course, a foreign, foreign minister, who seems to be now working for another master, the United Nations, the United States, and the United Kingdom. And uh, he, has, he seems to be oblivious issues of human rights, European law, the European Convention on Human Rights, and uh, Alexander Downer is going to find out, much like some of his predecessors did, that the Greek Cypriot Republic is not going to fall for the track he's setting up for them. Again, we can talk about these things uh, if you want to later on. I probably have not offended any friends of Alexander <laughs> uh, but you know, that's the reality. I know the man. Uh, Foreign Minister, he was different, but he was an Adelaide, elected from an Adelaide-based audience compared to what he's now, but we does not make. Anyway, the 50 years of the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, in 1960, when Cyprus gained its independence from Britain, uh, a lot of people described Cyprus as the reluctant republic, because the Cypriots did not want to become independent. They wanted to unite the Greece. And they saw that in the context of self-determination uh, and the choice, of course, of uniting the motherland, culturally, historically, and so on. It didn't happen because during the course of the anti-colonial struggle, uh, Turkey got involved thanks to the British uh, diplomatic service. And the end result was that uh, the choice was between partition and uh, independence. Rather than being partitioned, Cypriots chose to be independent. The only problem was they were handed the independence documents. They did not have part in negotiating the independence agreements. They did not have a, a, a voice in shaping the constitution that was based on the independence agreements. So in many ways, independence was changed from day one. And as I said, Cyprus became the reluctant republic, the 100th member of the UN in 1960. In October, when Cyprus celebrated its 50th anniversary, celebrations in Cyprus were rather subdued. They had parade, they had speeches, and all that kind of stuff. 
And of course, it was marked by the absence of any Turkish Cypriots from the celebrations of our 50th anniversary of the Republic, which also showed the kind of contempt that the Turkish Cypriots have for the Republic they want to be part of. So, another interesting little sideline. But it also reminded me that in 1961, Cyprus became independent because of the connection of wanting to unite to Greece rather than become independent. The independence celebrations in 1960 were also rather low-key. So history repeats itself 50 years later. You know. But yet, uh, even though gaining independence in 1960 was the first important step, maintaining and consolidating the independence became even a greater challenge in view of what Cyprus faced from 1961. Now, in this particular case, the 1959 Zurich and London agreements, that, uh, these are the agreements that gave Cyprus its independence, were negotiated between Greece, Turkey, and England. Uh, the Cypriots did not negotiate, they were told to accept them, or if they rejected the agreements, they would be partitioned. A partition plan was by Macmillan, the then Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, and the end result was that uh, they received a kind of a dysfunctional constitution that nobody knew whether it would work and how. Now, the other uh, characteristic of Cyprus of independence <coughs> was that they did not have much experience in national and international affairs. The Cypriot, sir, the Cypriot elite was a highly educated elite. There is no doubt about that. But uh, their political experience had been at the local level. Local government, local issues, or the question of self-determination. Suddenly, these people become government leaders. They have to develop an international personality. They have to develop a foreign policy. They have to do all these kinds of things. So that was the first major challenge that they, found, that they faced. And then they had those dysfunctional constitutions with minority, and minority vetoes, minority votes, separate from those of the majority that blocked the effective work of the Cypriot political institutions. Now, critics, since the collapse of the, the, the original constitution of Cyprus of 1960, in 1963, critics have said, well, you know, if the Greek Cypriots were a bit more flexible, things perhaps would have gone that way. It's nice to say that from far away. I, I suggest for people who really don't know the details of what happened between 1960 and December of 1963. To take a look at some of the material that's available in that period, there is a very uh, excellent study done by Stanley Smith, an English constitutional lawyer, who pretty much finds the constitution of Cyprus and the agreements that gave its independence to be unique, unprecedented, and impossible to work. But, you know, sometimes, and I'll be tonight rather critical of the diplomacy of my own country, in 1959, in July of 1959, months after the independence agreements were handed down to Cyprus, the Intelligence and Research Bureau of the U.S. Department of State did an analysis of the independence agreements. This is the one of the most prophetic documents that has ever been written about Cyprus. Because in July of 1959, a year before the actual independence of Cyprus, American analysts from the State Department said, those agreements will fail, and they will fail for the following reasons. One, two, three, four. Here is why the failure will come about and by Jove. Come December 1963, the, the, the constitutional crisis came about because the deadlocks developed the way pretty much the intelligence and research analysis from the Department of State had predicted it would. Anybody who had any notion about Cyprus knew what was going to happen. Now, the problem was that once the crisis, the constitutional crisis came about in 1963, all sorts of other external forces got involved in Cyprus. 
there was destabilization of the Cyprus government, a lot of ex external interference from the United States, from Britain, from Turkey, you name it. And the end result was that Cyprus had to stabilize itself, maintain a legitimate government in place, and then fight at the international front threats that they faced for, like threats for the intervention of Turkey in Cyprus and so on. Turkey, but by the way, the southern Turkish military bases are 40 miles north of the island of Cyprus. Well, the Security Council in March of 1986, uh, I'm sorry, in March of 1964, did a very, passed a very significant unanimous resolution defining the legitimacy and the continuity of the Republic, sending also the UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus and setting the stage for the internationalization of the Cyprus problem. It also appointed mediators to help resolve the constitutional crisis in Cyprus. So, both the peacekeeping and the peacemaking activity of the UN dates back to March 1964. Uh, the reality was that uh, Cyprus, while struggling to survive as an independent state, in 1963-64, out of that constitutional crisis, it also tried to develop institutions, procedures, compatible to those of any Western democratic European country. That's a difficult task to do, balancing external threats with internal, uh, internal institutional developments. And yet, they did that very successfully, and Cyprus, by 2004, had become a vibrant liberal democracy member of the EU. <coughs> now, one of the interesting things that I noticed about the first years of the Republic in Cyprus was that despite the problems, external, internal, subversion, and all those kinds of things, uh, the Cypriot economy moved along perfectly well. And one of the interesting things was that despite the ideological diversity of the Cypriot political parties, including one of the, most, of the largest communist parties in Europe, despite ideological rhetoric, there was consensus on how to run the economy. And that has been the success of the of Cyprus, because despite the troubles, the economy grew, the economy helped Cyprus get into the EU, Ideological rhetoric may have been wonderful in the debates in the newspapers, but when it came down to practical economic policy, Marxism went out of the window, you know. <laughs> so it was, uh, Cyprus is one of those interesting things. Anyway, and I'll make one very quick little parenthesis here. Talking to an Italian diplomat, uh, high-ranking Italian diplomat, soon after the end of the Cold War, he was telling me that uh, Cyprus can make a lot of money. I said, how? Ah. He said, tourism. I said, they do that already. He said, no, no, no. Different kind of tourism. Bring foreign tourists to see what the Communist Party looks like. <laughs> Even in the post-Cold War period, they have oh, a novel idea of approaching the topic. You know. uh, anyway, the, uh, what, what I think I have been writing about and talking about is, of course, the kind of struggle that Cyprus went through in trying to develop a political entity recognized at the international level, which it is, but at the same time to fight off those who try, who try to support it. Because from 1963, the constitutional crisis of 1963 until now, there have been all these foreign mediators who have come to Cyprus and they speak of reunification, reconciliation, a new constitution, and of course, you have to read the fine print in what they're proposing. And the fine print, of course, has brought about plans like the NATO plan of 1964 that George Wall tried to impose in Cyprus, where the government of Cyprus would be subordinated to a NATO political and military and the NATO peacekeeping force would pretty much come and take over things that you see today in Bosnia and places like that. Well, that didn't fly very well. George Ball tried to replace the, the elected government of Cyprus with alternate Cypriot leaders who played game, who played the game, failed. 
That didn't stop Dean Acheson, the former U.S. Secretary of State, in the summer of 1964, to propose other plans for the solution of the Cyprus problem. Acheson put out, in the summer of 64, three specific plans, all of them trying to play up the need to unite Cyprus to Greece, but to give Turkey something it wanted. So, 13% of Cyprus was going to be given to Turkey, Greece was going to turn over a number of islands to Turkey, and the remainder of Cyprus was going to be given to Greece, in a manner by which they even violated the Greek constitution. Again, thanks to the guts of President Makarios, the Atchison plan failed. All the plans that followed since then were based on those types of trade-offs, on a lot of constitutional vagueness, and then details like don't worry about issues about the constitution, later on about the presence of Turkish groups in Cyprus, we can negotiate those later on. But the devil was always in these details. The ABC plan, the 1978 American British Canadian plan of Cyprus, again, resolution, reconciliation, and all that, uh, basically wanted to commit the Cypriots to a confederation in Cyprus between two separate autonomous states and negotiate later the details like the Turkish troops remain in Cyprus. Turkish settlers remain in Cyprus, would the refugees return to their homes? Said, Don't worry about these things. We worry about them later. Well, that's not how you negotiate. But anyway, and the uh, end result was that uh, the reconciliation process has not worked. It's not worked because it has not dealt with the real issues up front in an open and democratic manner. This is why when we got to the situation in 2004 with the Anand plan, all the talks, all the concessions, all the violations of human rights that the Anand plan was proposing to do in dissolving the Republic of Cyprus and creating a new, a new state uh, that Richard Holbrook had dreamed uh, in, in his mind, we had, an ex we had a case where uh, the Cypriot public found out at the last minute what all those prolonged talks for two years had produced. They didn't know. There were leaks in the papers. And one lovely day, they, thought they were told that the Anand plan consisted of 9,000 pages of constitutional technicalities that even lawyers had a difficult time understanding what they were all about. And you're interested in human rights. Do you know that even though Cyprus by 2004 was becoming of a, a member of the European Community and Cyprus was a, uh, a ratified European Convention on Human Rights, if you were from England, Germany or any other part of the European Union, you had rights in Cyprus. But Greek and Turkish Cypriots under the Anand Plan could not go to the European Court of Human Rights to challenge any provisions about violations of their rights, being property, personal rights, and things like that. This, that kind of devilish scheme that they had prepared. Uh, so the Cypriots, of course, uh, rejected it because, it was, as I said, a confederation of two autonomous states, basically a confederation creating, uh, more or less validating the results of the Turkish invasion. Now, let me just move on and talk a little bit about, because I'm talking about what others did and what others did not do and so on. What uh, I would like to stress is that in all the troubled history of the Republic of Cyprus from 1960, from 1960 independence, the collapse of the constitutional arrangements in 63, the invasion of Turkey in 1974, and so on, there are good things that have happened in Cyprus uh, in that period of time. And one of the many good things is that Cyprus, as I said to you before, has become a vibrant democratic state, vibrant in its economy, in its society, in its politics. Uh, and in 2004, the fact that the government of Cyprus did become a member of the EU said a great deal of how much was achieved under very negative circumstances. Now, another positive development that we have 
had is that over the years you've had the recognition of the legitimacy of the Republic to become a member of the EU and represent the totality of, the of Cyprus, not just merely the free areas of Cyprus. It shows you the, the attitude of the European <coughs> Union toward its member. Second thing, of course, uh, Cyprus has been through political changes. I described the, the early period of the Republic of Cyprus as the period of charismatic politics, meaning you had Archbishop Carius, who became the first elected president of Cyprus. I consider him a charismatic sort of political figure. My friend Dinos Kumazos over there does not, but that's okay. Uh, the point is, he was a unique political figure in a unique political time. But he died, he passed away in 1977, natural causes. And from that point on, once charismatic figures go, uh, it allows for other political forces to rise and fill the gaps that existed. So that has been the development of Cypriot, alternate Cypriot political leaders. And also uh, the development of Cypriot political parties, the way political parties function across Europe. That is a very significant development. Then, uh, Cypriot identity has also developed without diminishing the Greek heritage of the largest majority of the Cypriot population. So Cypriots are Cypriots, but they're also very proud of their Hellenic heritage, culture, history, and so on. Also, in the last 50 years, there has been finally an appreciation of the equality between Cyprus and Greece. Because in the early days of the Republic, Greece acted pretty much like a kind of an imperial power. Uh, they decided Cypriots were supposed to follow. And of course, that kind of tactic led to the Turkish invasion in 1974, after the Greek Kunta, my favorite institution that could be the Fort Marshal, uh, uh, decided to, to stage a coup and overthrow the government of the Republic of Cyprus. So the acknowledgement of the equality in the relations between Cyprus and Greece helped a great deal. Uh, then, the Parliament of Cyprus has become like any other Western European Parliament, particularly after the legislative reforms of 1981. Uh, the Cypriot Parliament now is a dynamic political institution, functioning with committees, making reports, investigations, and everything else. Then, you have electoral politics at all levels of government. For many years, mayors are not elected. Now, the whole political system, all levels of government, are part of a very vibrant electoral process. And of course, we have the rise of civil society, which in any democratic society is very much a part of democracy. Even in Cyprus, where civil society has been funded extensively from outside and for the wrong reasons, it's good to see that civil society has come to life in Cyprus as well. And of course, they have developed a very good diplomatic service, which is a good, positive development if you are in trouble and you have to defend and promote your interests abroad. <laughs> now, another positive development is the political maturity that has come about in Cyprus. And again, some of you may disagree with me. But in 2008, in the presidential elections in Cyprus, the president who got elected, the current president of Cyprus, comes from the Communist Party. Marxist ideology party that had been marginalized, the party that had been marginalized at key points in the history of Cyprus. But yet, the, the Cypriot public was willing to elect a person like that 